Chris Day, Vice Chancellor and President of the University, and it's my great pleasure to invite you to our first uh, event at this incredible new building, the Catalyst. Isn't it amazing? Um, many of you may have been seeing it going up gradually over the last two or three years, like I have, and to now be in it um, is, is just fantastic. I'm extremely proud of this building and obviously of the Newcastle Helix site that you have also seen develop over the last few years, which we've developed in partnership with Newcastle City Council, our very close partners. Um, these are developments that we believe are not just transforming this part of the city, um, but have the potential, as you'll hear in a while, to transform the future. It's the new home for two national innovation centres, one in ageing uh, and one in data. And as this name suggests, uh, the work in this facility, the Catalyst, we believe is going to transform ageing and data-related innovation. To give you some example of the uh, esteem in which the ageing research is held here in Newcastle, just to give you a little bit of history about why we're in this building. Um, about five years ago, George Osborne, who was then the Chancellor, had this idea uh, around the Northern Powerhouse, that all of the money and the investment in the country was going into the South East, and they needed to um, create the Northern Powerhouse and, and start investing in the North. And there was an idea to uh, invest in Manchester around a, a discovery called Graphene, um, and they created an innovation centre in in Manchester around graphene, which is going up uh, as we speak. Uh, and George Osborne then rang the chief science advisor at the time, Mark Walport, and said, Mark, we need to do something else in the north, and I don't know about anything else that's any good. <laughs> uh, so I got one of those very rare phone calls from Mark Walport, who, being the chief science advisor, did know what was any good in the north, and he thought the best thing in the north was the ageing research in Newcastle. Um, so he rang me and said, Chris, would you like a new building and a new institute in ageing? Um, and I said, absolutely, Mark, that would be marvellous. But that's just an example of just if you wanted evidence about the, uh, the track record of this place, and I'll come back onto that in a minute. The other little anecdote to tell you about what happened following that, I think, is if you're trying to work out what a National Innovation Centre does, I in ageing anyway, you'll hear I say more about that in a moment. Uh, Louise Robinson, who's our... Uh, Regis Chair of Aging is in the audience here, and Louise and I put this bid together as to what we were going to do with this money if we got it to build an innovation centre, and we had to go in, down to Treasury on a, on a, about, about five years ago to this day, 2014 December, to be put in front of the First Secretary to the Treasury and the Chief Science Advisor to convince them, and we were really struggling to get across the concept to them of what this thing might do. Um, and so Louise told them a story about something that she'd been involved in, um, which turned a light bulb on in their heads, because I guess they both had um, older parents, and this sort of rang, that, rang that, uh, that bell for them. And the story was, many of you have seen um, patients, older patients, uh, and individuals with these alarms around their neck, that if they fall over, they can press a button and the ambulance arrives. And, um, but what Louise, who's a an expert in ageing, particularly related to dementia and general practice, to, uh, had spotted was that uh, lots of people didn't like the stigma of having this thing around their neck, and so they wouldn't wear it, even though it would be very sensible for them to do that. And so she and her colleagues had the idea of putting this alarm into brooches for ladies and uh, into watches for, for men and women, who could have this very uh, easy to uh, disguise object on their person that nobody would know what it was and then they could press it and just that change inventing that made many many people wear this device that otherwise wouldn't and just that simple bit of thinking and that innovation turned that light bulb on in the heads of the secretary to the treasury um, and we got our money and I, I just think that's quite an interesting thing you only what does an innovation centre do so here in this very building um, we're bringing together experts in aging and data businesses uh, and importantly members of the public and many of you I know um, are in the room here have been involved in this, our voice network, valuing our intellectual capital and expertise, uh, to work together to support research and development that will give rise to new products, services and technologies that will help all of us uh, live better and longer lives. Our approach has always been to c not consider ageing uh, as a challenge or a problem, or certainly not as a problem, but also consider it as an opportunity. Um, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. And I think it's really odd, isn't it, something about the British that see the fact that we're all living longer and we've got an older population somehow as a problem that's a burden on the health service, for example, not thinking of it as we do as one of the wonders of modern medicine and public health, an achievement that should be celebrated with numerous opportunities to be grasped in health, finance, housing, work practices, just to name but a few. 
As I've hinted, Newcastle University has a long history of excellence in ageing research. Helping people to age well so that they remain engaged members of society is the focus of much of our research. And as such, we want to ensure that Newcastle remains at the vanguard of national and indeed global uh, research addressing these needs. And I'm very pleased to see uh, Jim Edwardson in the audience. He was one of the original founders of what we believe to be the first Institute of uh, Aging. At that point, it was called the Institute of Health and the Elderly, founded 25 years ago in 1994. I think it was the only one of its type in the world at the time. And Jim, along with Oliver James and uh, Ian McKeith and uh, sadly departed Roseanne Kenny, who left us to go back to Dublin, were the founders of that. And the idea was to bring together every aspect of aging research from people trying to work out why cells stop dividing after 20 or 30 divisions right through to people working out did we have the right pensions for an aging society and bringing that expertise together was the real uh, uh, moment that Newcastle aging really took, took place and began to be what it is today. We've also, because of the efforts that we've been making um, here and, and elsewhere, convinced the government, the government that we currently have until whenever it is this evening, um, <laughs> that when they were coming up with their industrial strategy to see if they could really boost the economy of the country, they come with these four grand challenges. And I think it was work done by many people in this room that convinced them that the ageing society should be one of the four grand challenges uh, which are part of that industrial strategy. And we've helped shape, our research has helped shape the calls for hundreds of millions of pounds that will now be poured in to this uh, aspect by the government. I'm going to tell you about some other development which is very relevant and exciting and which the uh, person that we're here to, to honour today, um, uh, donation, uh, will help us very much with. So about a mile away from here, where a lot of our ageing research goes on, you have something we call the Campus for Ageing and Vitality. Many of you know it um, as the old Newcastle General Hospital site and there again we're working with our City Council and our two excellent NHS Foundation Trusts to create a new ambitious 15-year vision uh, for that site. The proposal is to expand the site, uh, the bit of uh, uh, university buildings at the back, and create a mixed-use development uh, on this 29-acre site. It will incorporate a world-leading basic research centre, bringing all of our university research in biology and engineering into one building. We'll create a test bed for innovations in care, both in the home um, and in the hospital care home setting, and a residential zone. Uh, where developers of, of housing can develop those houses that will be fit for the 100-year life uh, rather than having people having to adapt their homes. We believe it will be a great attractant for businesses. It will create jobs. It will create a place to skill up um, the population. That might be just people who are caring for relatives um, as well as the professionals. And, of course, it will play a huge part in regenerating the west end of Newcastle, um, which clearly needs it. And if you want to think about the link between where you are now and, and that site, well, the way we envisage it is that um, companies and scientists will be working in the innovation centres for ageing and data here and will develop products, prototype products, but where do they test it? Obviously, if they have a medicine, they test it in their hospitals, and we've got very good hospitals to do that, but if they develop a piece of software um, or a new assisted device, where do, they, where do they test that to see whether this is a product with legs? And the idea is they go half a mile up the road and they test it in this test bed facility. So that's how we see this linking very well with that. So this is a hugely ambitious project for us, uh, but we think it will ensure that Newcastle remains the global centre of excellence uh, and innovation and creativity in the field of ageing that it is today. Which brings me to the reason that we're here this evening, and that is to celebrate the enormous uh, important relationship between Helen McArdle, CVE, and Newcastle University and to thank Helen for her remarkable and unprecedented support for the work we're doing here to tackle the global challenge associated with an ageing population. As you arrived this evening, you'll have passed through the atrium, which is the heart of the catalyst and a space that we hope in future will be the birthplace of many inspirational ideas and exciting new collaborations. It's very fitting, therefore, that we have named the atrium in Helen's honour in appreciation of the wonderful contribution to our work of her wonderful contribution to our work, which will enable us to continue being a global leader in the field of ageing. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Helen and her family, those who are not stuck in a traffic jam, unfortunately, Helen, to the Catalyst this evening, and I'd like you to give a round of applause for that contribution. Thank you.
As many of you will know, the name Helen McArdle Care is synonymous with quality and innovation. It was recognising the need for high quality care that led Helen to build her first care home, the Beamish Residential Home in West Pelton in County Durham. A forward thinker who always challenged the traditional care home stereotypes, over the next 20 years she went on to establish more than 50 care homes, changing the face of care of the older person in our region. In 2015, her achievements were recognised with the award of a CBE for being an outstanding care provider. Since retiring, if you could call it that, Helen has become one of the region's most generous benefactors to a range of organisations that are playing their own part in helping society. Most recently, Helen has made some of the largest donations ever received by Newcastle University, but also by the Prince's Trust, the Newcastle United Foundation, the University of Sunderland and Willowburn Hospice. She's also been a very valuable member of our university court that keeps an eye on all that we do uh, and guides us in our strategy and our investments. Now, I don't want to put too much pressure on Nick uh, uh, and Steve, who are speaking this evening, but they should know that Helen herself considers our relationship so important that she actually turned down a personal invitation from Emily Sonday uh, to be a special guest at her performance tonight, so you better do well, love. Um, <laughs> but seriously, Helen, we are incredibly grateful for your support and for your presence here this evening. To finish up, it's also my great pleasure to welcome another very special guest to host this evening's lectures. She is someone who has been an advocate for our commitment to innovating for better, longer lives for many years. In fact, almost five years ago to the day, she received an honorary doctorate in civil law from the university in recognition of her support for our research into ageing. And I may say she hasn't aged a day since. <laughs> in 2017, she was awarded a CBE for services to dementia care in her role as a development lead with dementia-friendly communities. She's an ambassador for the Alzheimer's Society and presented the BBC's How to Stay Young, a program that investigated the latest experiments and research that could help put the brakes on aging. Unsurprisingly, uh, she spent two weeks in Newcastle making that program because many of, uh, most of the, much of the science that was presented during that program was done here, as you would expect. So in short, I can't think of anyone better to host the inaugural McArdle Festive Lectures Please join me in welcoming to the stage our host, honorary graduate, much-loved journalist, broadcaster, and dare I say national treasure, Angela Rippin, CBE. <laughs> oh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, um, it's absolutely true. I do keep a portrait in the attic, which <laughs> does help. Um, good evening and welcome, and first of all, may I say not just welcome, but thank you for coming out on what I gather is a terrible night out there. It's just not very pleasant at all, but it is wonderful to see all of you. And welcome, all of you and honoured guests, to an evening which I think uh, through some of the country's leading scientists is going to be taking you on a trip into the future, because that is the future of ageing through data, personalised health, and citizen insight. Now our launch pad for this journey into the future is this magnificent brand new building, the Catalyst and the Helen McArdle Atrium. And tonight's inaugural Helen McArdle festive lectures are by way of an official launch because this is the very, very first time that this building has been used in this way and has been made open to the general public now, for those of you who are not familiar with the site, though I suspect most of you probably are, we are at the heart of Newcastle Helix, a 24-acre site developed in partnership with Newcastle University, Newcastle City Council, and Legal and General to service international technology and science businesses, residents, and indeed the local community. It is a totally unique flagship development it is the only city centre site of its kind anywhere in the United Kingdom. And here we've got hundreds of researchers, businesses and progressive homeowners all living and working side by side, along with the infrastructure and facilities that will eventually, when the site is finished, provide great food, great drink, entertainment venues, as well as three beautiful new public spaces. So already, just by being here this evening, we are already looking into the future of totally integrated science, business, and social communities. But this is so much more than just a collection of cutting-edge buildings. This is a 24-acre test bed 
and collaborative ecosystem for public and private bodies that is genuinely unlike anything else anywhere in the UK. I suspect probably anywhere else in Europe. And tonight, we are celebrating the innovative work and ideas that are already coming out of this building as we explore the title of this evening's lectures, The Future of Aging, through the application of data, advances in personalized health, and the involvement in citizen insight. Now today I've had the great pleasure of seeing for myself some of the work that's already been carried out in this building. First of all, in the drive lab, where scientists, engineers, and older drivers are all working together to define the technology that's going to make driving a lot easier and safer for motorists as they age. And uh, if none of you have had a go at it, I don't know, can they all apply to come and have a go? Because it's huge fun, you really should do it. <laughs> and also in the gate lab. Now that's not a lab that's got lots of five barred gates in it. It's the GAIT lab. It's where groundbreaking work is being done to diagnose specific strains of dementia based on the way that people walk. Now the work is going to enable clinicians to pinpoint exactly the kind of dementia that someone has and therefore the kind of treatment and medication to be prescribed to that specific condition. Something that I find absolutely fascinating because I have been involved with the dementia community for a long time. I co-chair the Prime Minister's Committee on Dementia-Friendly Communities and I am an ambassador for the Alzheimer's Society and I know that the Society fund some of the work that's being done in that lab and I can't tell you how innovative, how incredibly brilliant that work is. Who would have thought that the way that you walk will give a scientist, a clinician, an idea of whether or not you have dementia and if so, what that dementia is and therefore how that dementia can be treated well in advance of it becoming a serious major problem which will give you an opportunity perhaps to either defeat dementia entirely or at least get the right kind of treatment that will slow down its progress. That's just one tiny example of the extraordinary, innovative, groundbreaking, exciting work that's being done here in the university. Tonight, we're going to take that journey into the future because here in Newcastle, as you've already heard, you have some of the most innovative and exciting research centres and staff that are devoted specifically to the science and the practicalities of ageing. So we're going to hear from Professor Nick Palmarini, who's the director of the National Innovation Centre for Ageing, where they work across academia, industry and the public to explore, to test and to bring to market products which pro promote really healthy ageing and well-being amongst all of us as we get older. We'll also hear from Professor Steve Kahi, who's the director of the National Innovation Centre for Data, exploring ways to unlock the potential for innovation that's offered by the explosive growth in new digital data. We would also have been hearing from Professor Mike Trunell, who's the director of the Innovation Observatory, who would be bringing, we hoped, his own crystal ball to look 10 years ahead into the future at the medicines, the devices and the diagnostics that are going to be available to the general public, again to promote good ageing and well-being. Unfortunately, his crystal ball must have been a bit clouded because what he wasn't able to foresee was that his entire family was going to go down with a Nova virus. So thank goodness actually he's not with us this evening. <laughs> but uh, sadly, we shall be missing him. But I'm sure that our two speakers will more than cover what he would be talking about and again giving us that very special insight into the future. But first, let's meet the woman behind this building, Helen McArdle, CBE. She made, as you've heard, an incredibly generous donation of two and a half million pounds to Newcastle University to support specifically their research into ageing. And this atrium, the one outside, is named after her in recognition of that donation. And so I think it's probably fitting that the only first major presentation in this building in the Helen McArdle Festival Lecture Series should come from the woman herself. So will you please all welcome 
This is Helen McArdle, CBE. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Helen McArdle Atrium. I'm honored and humbled to be here this evening at the inaugural McArdle Lecture. Can you all hear me? Is this working? Forever young, what does that mean? Well, if you listen to the lyrics from my old friend Rod Stewart, it is a wish for someone to remain young at heart, no matter how old they are. But that's easier said than done. Growing older doesn't always allow us to do that, does it? I used to jump out of bed every single morning on a mission to make a difference. Now, I still have that enthusiasm, but there's a little less of the jumping. <laughs> but my first real experience of the challenges that come with aging was when my family and I started building and operating residential care and nursing homes. I was quite naive in the beginning about the task at hand I knew what it meant to care. It was in my genes. After all, I was the eldest of five sisters and the mother of four children. I knew what good quality care looked like. I had a, my mother by my side constantly advising me. But what I didn't know until I started caring for older people was the far-reaching impact that dementia, Alzheimer's, mobility issues had on individuals and how it affected their families, and what it meant for our care staff and nurses. And it was a steep learning curve. Now, of course, there's so much more research and information available about aging. And as a society, we're talking about it more, sharing knowledge and ideas. This is such a positive and important development, but there just wasn't that insight when we first started out. However, we were determined to make a difference. So we learned all that there was to know and made it our business to be innovative and forward thinking, to ease some of the trials that come with growing old. But as they say, all good things must come to an end and after 30 years in the care industry, this lady here was becoming older herself. So together, we made the difficult decision to sell Helen McArdle Care. But regardless of my age, I still have the drive to make a difference, particularly for older people. And so when we looked at ways to give back to the Northeast community, the future of aging was high on the agenda, particularly as the National Innovation Centre for Aging was right here on our doorstep. And tonight, standing here, I can't help but feel a huge sense of pride knowing that our family's work has not only made a difference to people in our care, but by working with the team here at Newcastle University, we will be changing lives for years to come. Aging is inevitable, and we're lucky, if we're lucky, we're all going to grow old. But now, thanks to research from Newcastle University and the National Innovation Centre for Aging, we're not just aging, we're aging well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. And in fact, we, we had fun this afternoon because Helen had to go on the drive machine, didn't you? <laughs> yes, she did. She giggled rather a lot, which I think means she... Probably. Did you nearly crash the car? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but fortunately in a laboratory, so it didn't matter too much. So we come to the first of our two speakers this evening. Professor Nick Palmarinia is the director of the National Innovation Centre for Ageing. He's a new boy here. He's been here 65 days, having come... Kind of, having come from, from the city of Boston, but he loves it here. He says he feels very much at home because the people are so friendly, which, of course, you all are. And I can say that because, as some of you may know, my father is, is a Geordieman, or was a Geordieman. He came from um, County Durham and was born in, uh, in, in the village of Cornsey, where they have the colliery. And uh, so half of me is Geordie, at least. <laughs> now, you know exactly, though, where the professor's coming from when he says... Ageism is an area of discrimination that affects all of us. 
we are all going to get old, aren't we? Clearly, he's acknowledging the fact that eventually we do all grow old and that the effect that that has on our prospects for work and our future lives. Now, in the past, he's spoken of an industry of longevity that's worth trillions of pounds to the UK and indeed to the rest of the world. And he admits that the challenge is to convince industries such as entertainment to fashion, insurance to banks, big technology players to utilities, and of course, health of the importance and the magnitude of those opportunities. His vision is to create a world in which we all live better for longer. So Professor Palmariani, come and tell us how we're gonna do that. <laughs> I hope my mic works, yes. Thanks for, thanks Angela. Thanks Mrs. Mercado for all your support. Thanks everyone for hosting me tonight because I'm feeling hosted. Uh, it's true what you said, I really felt like I was uh, joining home after being in the United States for seven years, uh, six years. Uh, from my Geordie accent you can get, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Italian. I moved to the United States but coming back to Europe, and then here was my first time, Chris, I guess it was June the first time, or August maybe, the first time we met, or Michael was, was June. I was so uh, surprised and feeling at home, so I really have to thank you for supporting me. I really feel in the place where I wanted to be. Um, talking about what's happening um, here in Newcastle, and coming from Boston, which obviously is a town that has this fantastic heritage, the MIT, Harvard, all the biomedical science that are happening there, so leading somehow research. And coming to Newcastle, many people ask me, why did you do that? And I think the reason is you first, but the second is just this is a fantastic ecosystem to make things happen. I think the size and the heritage of the university, and Louis Robinson is here to teach all of us a lot about this domain. Um, it's uh, uh, probably one of the best place on earth where to make the thing happen. And I realized exactly this thing. Then there's many people I will thank later in this room, but first let me uh, guide you on this path tonight about a couple of consideration about uh, the concept of aging. You'll see there will be less science and more something related to us. But first, let me set the stage. I think that you've seen this story many times about that one of the two mega trends happening in the world to not to today, one is the climate change and the other one is aging. Now, the numbers more or less are uh, fluctuant based on um, data coming from the census statistics, WHO, but now we're more or less crystallized. These numbers are more or less crystallized and the sentence is broken by purpose because by 2050, you have Japan, and sorry, it's not a case of an Italian talking here tonight, because one of the other country, by 2050, the other 31 that will have the same age of Japan today in more or less 30 years will be this country, and you see one big one out there, which is China, which from in terms of numbers, we're gonna literally change the game. As I was saying, you don't see UK there, but you see Italy, that's why probably there is an Italian on stage <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Because for us, as many other countries in Europe, and I'm not saying that you are not aware of what I'm telling, we are aware about the process of aging far more than other countries. So this is something that I always try to tell to my citizens in Italy, but I suggest also as well to you that we know something about aging that others don't, and think about these countries as potential market for the future. So how can we sell and tell them a story on how to age better that it's coming also from something very intangible, which is the relations, which is the understanding, which is the society itself. So I think we should have to start thinking that the idea of a village and being as part of that village, knowing each other and exchanging something, which again, it's very hard to explain in numbers or in science, but it goes deep about the correlation that we have between us is something that not all the countries have, and for example, the United States don't. The problem they have about social isolation is very different from ours, and it's given from a very different kind of society. One thing that I always say is when I moved to the United States, that moving in the 50s, because I moved uh, there uh, six years ago, so I was my 49, 
is the first thing coming as a European, you realize they don't have a national health system, and you literally see people dying on streets, which is something that for us, culturally, is something that we can't admit. We can't think about it. Because again, we have something that is our social system, that it's who we are and what we are that makes the difference. And it's something in deep that we should have to consider. Then if you have seen the title before my presentation, I was focusing around the concept of opportunity. Why the economic opportunity is important? Because if you want to make a change and we want to have in, an impact that it's covering all the sides of society, we need to, to involve those that can, you know, literally change the game and think about technology and it will be a topic we're going to cover in my speech, um, those to be part of the play because those will, those will enable services, products to be available to everyone and then have help and impact on, uh, on everyone. I don't know if you know the cost of anti-acids for your stomach in the 70s. They were very expensive, very expensive. And today are just becoming a sort of a commodity that you can buy for, for uh, I think, half of a pound, even less probably. And how many benefits that, that type of research has come to all of us? So that's healthcare, that's pharma, which is something, let me say, pretty normal to um, associated to aging, which is another of the things that I would like to de demystify this evening. Now, what's happening in the world? If you see about how much the advertisers spend on their advertising, this is the number. So you see that only, sorry, it's going ahead by itself. Oh, can you go back? What's happened? Oops. Um, it's not working anymore. This is going by itself, sorry. Uh, can you shut it down? No, no, it's not a problem. I can go. If you quit and just bring it back. Okay, thank you. Okay, here I am, sorry. This is the first night, so we're testing everything. <laughs> <laughs> there was not one presentation ever in my life. There was not something that was going wrong. So it's absolutely normal. So I'm done for the evening. Hope there's nothing else. Um, that's what the advertisers are spending. So they see millennials as an opportunity and they think that they have to put all the money there, just selling them something. And you, the number is pretty huge, 500% uh, percent more on millennials than all the other categories, and mainly the older adults. Now the point is that it's just like they're not seeing the market, because if you see the demographic, these people which deserve all our attention, I'm not saying anything against it, but I'm saying that maybe there's not very balanced the way they're investing, uh, it's also targeting a kind of a population which historically is poorer and it has less time available because theoretically they should be far more involved in doing things and try to, you know, uh, um, study do all the, the, the things why us in a different stage of our life could have a little more time. There's another consideration uh, that only 35%, this was a survey that has been done a couple of years ago and you can find it in a beautiful book by Joe Copeland. It's uh, only 35% uh, of people over 75 say they felt old. So the idea is just if you don't feel old, you don't buy things that are designed for someone who's old because you're not thinking like an old person. In the progresses of your life, you think about who you are, which not necessarily is related to age. By the way, the guy in the picture in the background is Lamberto Boranga. He's a very famous Italian goalkeeper from the 70s. And he's 75 years old, he came back to play professionally. When he quit playing professionally, he got two degrees, medicine and, pharma and pharmacology, and then he decided he was getting bored, as it happens in life. So boring and purpose, I think, are the two key words about how we could see ourselves in the future. Um, and he decided to play back professional. Now he's a professional player, back again at 75. Now it's 76 because it was last year. Uh, Moody's, not later than six months ago, so we're talking about 2019, made their own research about what's going on on the aging market, and look what they say. Now, the second sentence is pretty understandable, let me say normal. They are saying, however, companies in the food sector, medical care, and home care <laughs> will benefit of a process of aging. So what's new there? It's absolutely normal. What, what surprised me was on the top, some business sectors such as transport, restaurants, electronics, clothing, and footwear will suffer because the elderly spend less on these things. Then you tell me if it's true or not. But I think that they had a very, let me say, old picture of our aging process. 
So the classic picture they had in mind, in my opinion, was the classic ladies playing the tamburello in Sardinia. This is a <laughs> picture I took myself, which are there. If you go to Sardinia, you'll find people like this. But my question is, where are the others? So where are all the others? Because typically what's happening in the process of aging, you turn 65, by the way, you know the story that 65 goes back to Bismarck. So we're talking about 800th century when he decided that, that people, since the life expectancy was pretty short, you could say, well, probably states could give some money since you will live for, I don't know, five years more when you're 65. And then they decided to create the pension system. So the idea of 65 goes back then, okay? And when you turn 65, it's just like you're putting all those humans that the day before were someone, very different one to each other with desires, wants, needs, very different in the same basket. Just like you turn 65, you have those needs. Which I think it's probably one of the biggest mistakes we keep on bringing on and which is still leading the idea that there is no market out there or there is no difference out there. So my question is, where are all we? Where is Iris Appelt, which is an icon of being in her late 70s that way? Or Kain and Kay, these two guys are Japanese. Uh, they have a, a million hundred followers on Instagram. They decided to become influencers. So it's not just doing by part time. It's their mission of life. So they understood that the social media is a, is a market and they created a story about themselves with their own style. Well, if these are professionals, so they decided by, by a decision to go that way, these are not. These are pictures taken in Milano by myself and are people that I think you can easily find in this room or going downtown in Newcastle. Where are these in the mindset of the brands? Or these three people, again, pictures taken by me. The one in the middle is in Boston. And she's on a transportation system that maybe can be designed a little better, but she's in using it. So Moody's, who the hell was thinking about when was designing that idea that people is not buying shoes, not going to the restaurant, not buying the things that could be fancy, just because you're 65, sorry, in that basket? I know every time I put this picture, this is Gianluca Vacchi. Uh, he's in the late, mid 50s, I'd say. A guy, an entrepreneur in Italy who decided to become a DJ. Now he has a DJ set in Ibiza. Again, I'm not judging it. I'm just ju ju judging him, sorry, him. I'm just thinking, why not? That's the point. And since the work we all are doing in, in, in our life expectancy, so the lifespan will increase. As you know, we just gained two years every 10 years in the last five decades, and we do nothing. It just happened because all the research, all the um, uh, improvement in the daily life are allowing us to go in that direction. So why not be DJs in Ibiza in the next 30 years? Tattoos or not, it's another decision, okay? <laughs> and then someone is realizing that could be a story that could be told. This is the mother of Elon Musk. It's May Musk. And she is doing advertising for Covergirl, which is a very young brand in the United States for makeup. Now, she was a photo model. Okay, so let's say that theoretically the career she's doing doesn't change. It's just, just the age is changing, but representing a sort of a new model. But what about this lady? She's not exactly the idea of beauty that we all had in, in, in mind. She's Patti Smith, and she's the new testimonial for Yves Saint Laurent. Why I'm, I'm just pushing the button around fashion? Because in the 60s, for example, Mary Quant, and all what's happening in those years, in a, such a powerful way, changed the narration of a generation. And if we're able to engage, for example, fashion brands, and again, someone is realizing that there is a space there, very few yet. Gucci, I've seen it yesterday, new uh, advertising. But someone is realizing that something is happening, and if we leverage these industries, fashion and beauty, for example, in the proper way, they can help us to start and telling a new story that says there is nothing to deal with age, it's who we are who makes the difference. And she is a difference herself in a story that has nothing to deal with beauty and fashion. It's pure rock and roll. Now, 
there is another side, so I'm not covering only the fashion side. It's uh, talking about technology for a second. And uh, look at this statistic. Who is the highest buyer of digital products online of Apple? Check out the age. Just to go against another mythology that since we are getting older, we're not using the technology, okay? So I think there is a, something that helps us to start seeing the things from a different perspective. Now, I, I used this chart in, in my previous life. It's basically a mapping of what's happening around the technological world. I don't want to deep dive, just to tell you that more or less artificial intelligence is going to be part of our daily life, and Steve will talk about it later on. We will be able to have deeper insight about what's happening um, for example, distributed deep learning, so the capability of system and machine to understand themselves and resonate about some processes, and from those data provide us insight is another way that it's going to happen. It's already happening. Uh, engagement reimagined, human-machine collaboration. How are we gonna interact with computers and robots in the near future? Can we command it with, with brain? Yes, we can. Can we command it with voice? Yes, if you have an Alexa. Can we command it with our eyes? Yes, we do. Or personalization at scale, and it's one of those spaces where I think we can literally change the game if we start thinking about solution for the diversity that is represented in this room tonight. And finally, a planet that is instrumented. We always talk about, for example, a smart home uh, or the idea of, you know, uh, aging in place. And aging in place is empowered by the understanding of what's happening in the context. So all these technologies are something that it's already there or, it's, or is happening very fast. The point is that all the technology in the world are nothing without a good idea. This guy is Chuck McCarthy. I invited him to give a speech here. I met him several times. Chuck is based in Los Angeles. He had been laid off, nothing to do, the only thing he has as, as a, an opportunity to raise some money was himself. He's a very nice guy, very empathic. So he decided to create a, what he called the company, the People Worker. He realized there was a lot of people that were stuck in their home in uh, Los Angeles, and they need only someone that can go there, just chat, have a walk. And this thing become, from a very simple, basic idea, a global platform. Now, the idea, for example, to leverage good ideas and technology and deliver innovation, it's what we want to do here at NEK. And for example, there is a company that is called On Hand, which is producing a very basic care system, leveraging people who have free time, students in this case, with older adults that maybe can need some help in doing the basic stuff, even be accompanied going around the for in the city, and it's using such a simple basic te technology, which by the way is there from the 50s, the GPS, to localize you, and suggest who's around under a certification made by the company. So the company is certifying that the people that it's serving others are good people, period, with the, with the process they have inside. But again, it's what it's called technically the uberization of care, and it's happening so many times. The first time I've seen it was uh, six years ago by two guys who left Twitter and built a company called uh, Join Honor, which has probably the first ever example in the world of this idea of caring in a very light way, helping people leveraging this type of technologies. <coughs> Patients like me is just a network of people like us who are sharing what works and what doesn't work for them. So the idea of networking, I think it's very powerful because they are helping research to improve the next stages of the research, just sharing how they feel when they're taking medication, what does it work, what it doesn't. As we all know, it's very complicated to design pharmas that works for everyone. We are literally discovering now that men and women are different in research, so that you know, the, the, the pre active principle inside pharmas has been designed dif differently, thinking about the differences. So these type of networks are literally changing the game. Or, this company in Boston has been uh, um, created by a, a professor called Leonard Guarente. Uh, this is not something that you can buy in a pharmacy. It's just like a nutritional you can buy in whatever store. Literally, the difference is that they just created a business model that you only can buy it if you order it and they send it, ship it to your home. It's based on NAD+, which is a coenzyme that they tell, or research tell, that should slow your uh, 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 aging process. Now, beside believing or not this story, look how this product has been packaged. 
does it look like a pharma or a medicine or more just like a clinic cream for your whatever wrinkles so i think the story is just already opening some of the market that you could imagine could be behind the idea of making us living better in the future point is that behind this company there are nine nobel prizes nine who are funding it uh, figure eight is a company in boston that is using some micro uh, stitch that you can attach to your muscle to understand exactly the micro move it to your muscle and they are serving an industry that is growing that is this one so would you like to come back play uh, tennis if you could not play tennis anymore using some of these robotic arms maybe not or maybe yes because probably the other point is that can you walk outside from your home for whatever reason you could not do it anymore now we have this idea about the robots which is very scary when you see these videos about the Boston Dynamics and you see these dogs that seem to be so aggressive, so powerful, they are just making things, and you can't control them. But if you are Hugh Kerr, who in 1982 at Mount Washington, climbing Mount Washington, was stuck uh, under a storm and he lost his two legs, he is a professor at the MIT Media Lab. If you just go in the Media Lab you, and you start hearing a noise, probably he is with his two artificial legs. And it's completely changed the game on how we can uh, be in the future as human that could be augmented from some of this, of this technology. Again, do we like it or not? I personally don't like it if I see this way, but I, am I in a situation where I can't walk anymore? So can this type of a technology help me bring back who I was and help me live the, way, the life I want to live or play tennis if I want to play tennis back again? Some robotics are entering the home. I'm not sure this Eliku will make the difference from what Alexa, for example, in Amazon is doing, but there's a permanent attempt of using upcoming technologies, those that I put you in that chart very crowded before, that are leading us to believe that there's ways in which we can be helped, or having sensor that will help us to know more about what's happening in our home, or using uh, artificial reality to do two things. This company, again, is based in Massachusetts. It's called Rendever. They are serving two types of customers. People with Alzheimer that needs to be revamped in memories, as you know, that could help them to live a better life, thinking about the things that are uh, peaceful, fruitful for their life. But also people that can go somewhere for whatever reason, and they can attend, for example, the soccer game. Sorry, this is very American, the football game. <laughs> because they have this crazy thing, they call it football in America. But this, the football game with uh, uh, their daughters or sisters or whoever. So it's literally a, a way to be present where you can't be. And it's a business that is growing up and it's leveraging a technology that typically is sold to the millennials or to grandson or to our son. Because this is the classic idea. If you see every single advertisement about VR and AR, it's all dedicated to them. And no one is still thinking, except a few ones, to use the same technology to, to do something different. Or have a psychological consultant through a mobile phone. Now, I know <laughs> we all prefer to deal with a human. But what if this is the new? And it was 20 days ago. I was just here when I just got this one. So if in the future we will need mental and psychiatric support, and no one can give it to us, can we rely on artificial intelligence that can understand what are our issues and provide us a feedback? I would answer yes. Maybe 10 years ago I would say, mm, no, I don't like it. But maybe, why not? Or there is an intelligence that is in this room and it's everywhere. It's about what about ourselves and our expertise and our life. So it's not only the skills we have or the experience that we collected but it's all the combination of these factors. It's typically disappear as soon as we retire. Why don't you bring it back to for whoever needs it? Think about all the startups that will need the experience of many of you in this room to help them understand how to make the business. Because for sure they have a great idea, but maybe they are not expert in making it happen. Why don't leverage someone of these experts, which by the way, could be collected, recruited, not collected, recruited, just between all of us, so we can all be part of it and keep on working. Or a deal we're trying to make with this company, it's called Piaggio, the same producer of the scooters, uh, who uh, is building new type of devices. It's a sort of a 
autonomous vehicle that follows you and helps you to bring your grocery where you're just doing shopping. Uh, it's interesting because it's exploring a domain that probably we will have to deal pretty soon. So all the robots that we can envision will be part of our life in 10, 15 years. So it's better to understand the today what works and what doesn't. So maybe we can design them properly with the help of people that uh, feels about it. Up to the last chart of this stage of my presentation, which is about what Jeff Bezos is doing. Maybe the planet won't be the best place where to live in the future. Why not Mars? And what will be the life of Mars except what David Bowie can suggest us? <laughs> um, if we will have the chance to go there, what do we think could be the difference? What do we think could be the game changers? I don't know if you read the news today, but someone is already trying to be the owner of gravity. So all the technologies that will help managing gravity will be part of this business. And gravity is something that refers to all of us from many perspectives. Think how much research could be there. So let me end with one thing before telling you slightly about Nikkei. This is my friend Federico Casalegno. He works, he's the head of experience design in Samsung in California and a professor at the MIT. And he says something so obvious and so important at the same time. He's saying that achieving human-centered design is possible only placing the people, only placing the people at the very center of every aspect of the design work, which must be prece uh, preceded by gaining an understanding of society, culture, human. If we don't involve ourselves in the play, where we could be cut out from those technology. So, <laughs> welcome to us. We basically would like to do this thing in this place. Thanks to all the support of you, I'm sure that we will achieve this goal. It's a pretty long definition, and I give you the time to read it because I have a shorter version in the following chart. But we want to do this thing, harnessing the business opportunity, leveraging these components that you see I put there, those in yellow are even more relevant than the others. And at the bottom, we want to enhance and enhance it, be enhanced by the human experience. We want to empower new business. We want to be holistic, we want to be global, and I really think we can do it from Newcastle, as something says there in the podium. And create new products and connect the less obvious dots. That's probably the most important things we're going to do. So the short version is this one. We want to add intelligence to aging and longevity. That's what we want to do. We want to connect the dots that are there and not seen by anyone and put them together. And like all the example I showed you before, that are clearly inventions from someone who saw the two technologies, augmented reality, virtual reality, the needs of people with Alzheimer, connected the dots and made something new that was not there helping someone else. Now, there are several types of intelligence but I think there is one that is more important than anyone else. Tina, should be you, this uh, source of intelligence and all the people of voice that it's in the room tonight, which I thank you for your contribution to the work we do. Because the source of intelligence that we have is ourselves. It's the intelligence that is coming from our experience, from our daily life, from caring about a sister or a mother for being part of a story that can be only told by each one of us. And I know you, each one of you has a different story. So let me tell you the story of what we do here. The boys at the Newcastle University are reaching out, not just nationally, but internationally, it, but with in other universities theory. throughout the country and with potential uh, international Well, there partners. are subtitles just for this Basically, purpose, so that's why we put it. Life experience and job experience and thinking ability of older people uh, to help older people and do research into older people's illnesses that's where my and disabilities thing, and so on. Wrong in the presentation. And it's absolutely <laughs> liberating and empowering. You really feel you're part of something quite innovative and exciting that's going to make life better for such a lot of people. When we realize trying to make it work, the, I the reach work. of voice and young nationally and internationally, I thought, goodness to me, wow, we're going to be part of that. I'm really very proud of it, and I think both boys and the uni should be proud because it's very innovative and inclusive. And I want to say respectful, 
But it's that feeling of partnership, the actually part of a Dina, I'm so home. sorry, because you have a and beautiful voice, by the way. But <laughs> for the city and for the region, actually. And I'm really glad that more people are going to come to know of it. Anyway, that was my thanking. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for all the people of voice inside the room as well to helping us to make the difference. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, Nick. Thank you very much indeed. I know you've thrown up lots of wonderful information there about the way in which I think that uh, commerce in general just underestimates the power, the spending power of people who are 60 plus, let alone the intelligence and the experience that they all have stored, which really should not be wasted. And I think on, on the question of um, whether or not advertisers, you mentioned uh, one there, um, who recognise the importance of using people at the centre of what they are selling. I think ladies will know that L'Oreal, I think were probably the first to use Helen Mirren and Jane Fonda, both in their 70s, to promote makeup. But um, lots, of, and there were, I'm hoping that we're going to have time for some questions. So I'm sure many of you will have questions that you'd like to put to Nick afterwards. But picking up on what you were talking about, the way in which, um, so you have to forgive me. I'm suffering from a terrible cold. So if I suddenly stop, <laughs> it's because. The voice is gone. And um, Nick, you were talking about the way in which people of a certain age now are buying more technology. I read a statistic this week that said that 80% of the people between 65 and 74 are now regular users of the internet, and that there's been a staggering increase in the number of those over 75, over 75 also using computers and modern technology. In other words, we've had a positive flood, a tsunami really, of silver surfers, which means that uh, I think all of that is probably music to the ears of our next speaker, because um, Steve Kochi is the director of the National Innovation Centre for Data. And uh, before that, he was something of a pioneer in the world of commercial technical innovation. The future of data is his area of expertise. So, um, Steve, come and uh, tell us what your predictions are in that particular field. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for that introduction, um, Angela, and thank you again, Helen, for your very generous gift. Uh, thank you, Nick, also for um, inspiring me to think maybe it's not too late for me to become a DJ in Ibiza. <laughs> I do have one drawback <laughs> compared to that guy. <laughs> that's the tattoo. That's the tattoo. That's what I was thinking. So, um, my name is Steve Coggy, and, and I'm the director of the National Innovation Center for Data, which is based in this building. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the future of data. I'm going to talk to you about the potential that data has to change our lives, but also some of the, at least one of the risks associated with the data explosion. Um, data is not quite as, as uh, amenable to a general audience, perhaps, as aging is. We're all aging. We all have some say in what's happening in the aging world. Data is a little drier. So I'm going to start out by trying to wire you with a few interesting statistics. So 90% of all the data in the world today was created in the last two years, right? So when I say data here, I mean any form of information captured on any medium. So I'm talking about texts, I'm talking about uh, music, I'm talking about video, I'm talking about health records, records from astronomy, biology, whatever. 90% of it created in the last two years. And that has been continuing for about the last five or 10 years, and there's no sign of that letting up. We're in the middle of an explosion in the amounts of data that we're collecting and utilizing. And this is even more astounding. Just by next year, every single individual on the planet, every second, we will be generating 1.7 megabytes of data, right? Now, to put that into context, a Kindle book is about 2.6 megabytes. So for every second, every person, we're creating the equivalent of two-thirds of a book, right, for next year. That's, these are astounding numbers, right? Um, it may be that there won't be a, a, a huge amount of quality in all of that data, but then there isn't actually that much, perhaps, in some of the Kindle books that are being self-published either. Um, right now, we are storing uh, 40 times more bytes of information than there are stars in the observable universe. Now, in my youth, that was the number that we got closest to infinity. When we talk, wanted to talk about really big numbers, we talked about stars in the universe. Today we're holding, each byte is eight bits, so we're holding 320 more, uh, times as many bytes or bits of information as there are stars in the observable universe. 
So all of this data is flooding in to organizations. This is, about, this is about the spend that companies are, are, are spending, commercial companies, on data analytics, trying to make sense of the data they're collecting. And this is only a fraction of the data. There's also the data that's being consumed by the public sector and by individuals and so on. But a huge amount of money is being spent on trying to make sense of all of this data. And the reason for that is that if organizations can understand all of this data that they're gathering, that's coming in from sensors they have on vehicles and on people, that's coming in from social media, that's coming in from their software systems, if they can make sense of it, then they can improve their business processes and reduce costs. But more importantly, they can understand their customers much better and produce new exciting services um, and products aimed at their customers. So this is of huge value to organizations. In the public sector, understanding all of this data that's coming in will help the public sector, uh, local government and central government, to spend the money where it's really needed instead of wasting it. Yeah? So this huge flood of data that's coming in and the value that it gives <coughs> It can only be unlocked whenever there are the right skills to access that data and make sense of it. And predictions are that by next year, there'll be something like 2.7 million job postings for people who have data science or data analytics in their title. And believe me, there are not 2.7 million data scientists out there looking for those jobs. So there's a huge shortage of those skills that will help organizations unlock all the value that's in all of that data. So let me make an analogy. So let me take you back to the 18th or 19th century. So this region, and many regions in the UK, were built on the exploitation of raw materials. And particularly in the Northeast, that was coal. So we're actually sitting right now on the Great North Coal Field that runs all the way from the north, from Berwick and Craster, down through Newcastle, down to, to Durham. And um, at that time, most of, most of that, uh, those materials were locked away under the ground. Some of it came to the surface, but most of it was locked away under the ground. So we had to apply two things in order to extract that and get value from it. The first was we needed a set of skills. We needed skilled people who knew how to dig the coal out. Right? These are the miners of, of the era. And just actually, just in passing, the person here, this quite tall person here, um, is actually the father of the guy who now runs data science at Newcastle University. Professor Paul Watson. This is his father training as a coal miner back in the 50s. Yeah? Um, so from one generation, they've gone from, from coal mining to data mining. Yeah? So skills. The other thing that we need um, in space is innovation. Because digging the coal out when it's at the surface is relatively easy. But to do this on an industrial scale, you have to dig deep. You have to dig laterally. And then you have to find ways of extracting all of that coal out of the coal mine and then transporting it to the cities and the places where they're actually going to make use of it. So you need steam engines and you need steam ships. And so the innovation in this region from people like uh, Parsons, Stevenson, Swan, Hunter, Armstrong, all of that innovation was necessary to industrialize this process. And once you can apply that combination of skills and innovation to these raw materials, then we were able to extract those materials out and build a whole series of industries around the use of those raw materials. So iron and steel um, smelting, heavy engineering, shipbuilding. And all of those things made this region immensely wealthy. So end of the 19th century, start of the 20th, this was one of the wealthiest regions in the entire world. In fact, from a shipbuilding perspective, this region was producing per annum 25% of the global production of shipping right? in this one region around Tyneside. And this all fed into the region and generated a huge amount of wealth. Skills plus innovation plus raw materials. So bringing that up to date, what's the raw material of today? Well, the raw material today of today for many organizations is data. Because there's a huge amount of value in it, it needs to be mined in order to get that information out of the data. So what we want to do is to do the same thing again. We want to apply skills and we want to apply innovation. And if we can do those in combination, then we can extract value from all of that data, and that will drive the creation of new exciting industries, and industries, in fact, today that we haven't even thought of yet. Right? So it'll drive uh, um, automated uh, manufacturing, software, uh, uh, submersibles, healthcare, retail, transport, whatever. All of those things will benefit from this extraction of information from data. And 
there's a potential utopia. I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid here, by the way. I don't necessarily believe this, but there's a potential utopia where we can use all of that data to make the right decisions at, at governmental level, at local government level, within organizations, perhaps within our own families and so on, to make the right decisions in order to help us live better, have better social outcomes, and generate more wealth across the entire region. You know, imagine a situation where, as a family, you are well connected to your health care and are able to utilize data gathered from sensors you're wearing. Gate was one example that you mentioned. Another is um, Alexa um, um, uh, looking at your, your voice and speech patterns in order to ascertain whether or not you're beginning to develop dementia or Parkinson's and things like that. There are lots of examples like this. Imagine if health systems were plugged into that data and could help you identify early when you were developing problems so that they could intervene and assist you. Imagine situations where school kids, we could identify early when they were having de developmental problems and intervene to assist them before they get into a situation of a family breakdown or criminality or whatever. So there's a potential utopia, right? However, the other side of that coin, we know that you ex we extract knowledge from data, and we know that knowledge is power and wealth, right? This is an example of, these are the, some of the wealthiest people in the world uh, from last year. I don't know if we'll do a quick quiz and see how many you know. This one? That's a tough one. That's um, Anancio Ortega who owns Zara, yeah? Zara Clothing. This guy? Warren Buffett, the investor. Very good, very good. Carlos Slim, Mexican magnate who owns lots of telecoms in, in Mexico. This done guy down here? Standing against Trump now. It's Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg. This guy looks like the devil. Larry Ellison from Oracle, yeah? This guy? Zuckerberg from Facebook, and this guy? Jeff Bezos from Amazon. So 10 years, well, 20 or 30 years ago, you'd have looked at this list and it would have included the queen and it would have included oil barons and property barons. Today, these lists are dominated largely by tech businesses. And even more than that, they're actually dominated by people who are making their money primarily from data. So Amazon and Facebook entirely from data. Oracle for the management of data. Bloomberg has made his fortune by exploiting financial data. The same is true to some extent Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, although he started out with software for the PC. Increasingly, he's making his business is now um, investigating large amounts of data and, and providing the analytics to give you information from that data. So increasingly, these people are gathering more and more data and using it to then um, create huge amounts of wealth for themselves. So there is a danger of a dystopia here. So we're now in a situation where the wealthiest 1% of the world own more wealth than the poorest 50% of the world. And that, that discrepancy is increasing all the time. So there's a danger that the super wealthy are creating huge amounts of power, they're unaccountable, uh, but they actually have a huge amount of influence on the rest of the society. So there's a, there's a danger side to all of this as well. Let's hope we get somewhere in the middle. So let me move on to what the National Innovation Center for Data does. So we're here to help organizations in the private or pri pri uh, public sector get the skills they need themselves to get value from their data. I pointed out before the huge shortage there is in data skills. Organizations, um, public and private sector, can't afford to buy these people in because they're demanding huge salaries because this has happened so quickly that the education systems haven't been able to keep up and produce people with the right skills to let you extract information from data. So we're going to help those organizations get that information, get those skills for themselves so they can do the job for themselves. Yeah? So we were awarded this money, 15 million from government and matched by 15 million very kindly from Newcastle University. We were awarded it because we're good at this stuff. We've been doing this stuff for many years. We're good at research. We're ranked world leading um, by the government. We're good at teaching in the space of computing science. We have a gold award in that space. And we're very good in engagement as well. We're actually ranked, they're pointing this, I guess. Uh, not that I can find it, no, it doesn't matter. We're actually ranked number one in the UK for the impact of our computing science research on society. Ranked uh, above Cambridge, who came second. Yeah? So we're good at all three of those things, and that's why we were given the award. We do three things. One is, from this fantastic new building and these two floors of public space, 
this room, the seminar rooms, the meeting rooms, uh, the boardroom upstairs, I guess, as well. We're going to run lots of events, and those events are going to be aimed at management teams to show them how important data is to their organization, <laughs> at technical specialists, at um, sectors, sector specialists, but also at academics and students, school kids. We want to get lots of school kids through this building. We want to bring school kids in because one of the problems we have in this region is there's a huge shortage of digital skills, and yet digital jobs are some of the best jobs that there are in society. They're clean, they're interesting, and they're exciting because we're really making a difference. But very few school kids are going into computing science and IT, and in particular, very few girls are going into those, those, those areas. In fact, the discrepancy between uh, girls and boys, the, the, difference, the difference in terms of percentages is, is going in the wrong direction. We're getting fewer women in as a percentage into computing science. So what we want to do is bring them into the building, show them something exciting around computing science, show them uh, roles for women, show them roles for people from their own social background, excite them about the potential of working in that space so that when they go back and make their choices about their, um, their um, GCSEs and their A-levels, they'll make ones perhaps that are aimed towards technology. So we want to use the building to help excite the whole um, of society, really, around the potential for data. The second thing we do is we map out, we have a data connections program, and that's basically mapping out who's who in the area of data. So which, which uh, vendors have got exciting new platforms and products, which SMEs have got innovative new solutions, which consultants can help, which students, above all, which students are looking for projects and internships and employment. And we're particularly keen on this space to get some of our students who are coming through some of the programs at the university to work with local businesses, because we find that if they work with a local business for three or six months during their course, at the end of the course, they're much more likely to move straight to that business rather than going to the papers and looking at the big numbers for salaries that they can earn in London and the east and west coast of the, uh, of the US. So by this means, we hope to keep some of those really talented people in, in the region and keep them benefiting the, the, the region. But the most important thing that we do is we run data skills projects. So data skills projects are projects where we engage with an organization about a real problem they have something that is keeping them awake at night, a real business-related problem. And they know that they have data for it, but they can't get their hands on the insight that's embedded inside that data. And then our team of postdoctorate experts will sit behind and beside their people and assist them in doing the job, in solving the problem, but more importantly, passing on new skills to that organization so that they can then go and help themselves. So we're selling fishing rods, not fish. And we're doing that not only for commercial businesses, but for the health sector, for local government, for, for everybody who has a data-related problem, which is almost everybody. And at the end of all of that, the hope is that organizations who engage with us within this building and these joint projects will go away with a return on investment, perhaps some new exciting intellectual property that they've developed, but above all, with a new set of skills that they can take back to their organization and then scale out inside their organization. And this is a way of making a real difference with, with some of the organizations we're dealing with. So these are the sorts of organizations that we're working with. The top, this top uh, right-hand corner, as you look at it, the larger private sector organizations in the region. This top corner here, the larger uh, public sector organizations in the region. So we're working, I'll give you a few examples, we're working with the NHS Business Services Authority to analyze pharmacy data, to, see, to identify situations when pharmacists are either making a lot of mistakes in how they're reporting what they're actually selling, or whether they're trying to defraud uh, the NHS. And we're working with uh, um, Axo Noble to investigate uh, paint surfaces on, on ships, because a couple of barnacles in a ship end up costing you a couple of percent in terms of your overheads for, for fuel, and that's hundreds of thousands of pounds for, sh for shipping companies. So we're helping with a broad swathe of organizations, helping them make up the skills that will let them make a difference inside their own organization. And we hope we'll be doing exactly that with the National Innovation Center for Aging, assisting them to understand the data that they're gathering about products and services associated with an aging demographic. And because we attract those big companies, we also attract in the big consultancies and the vendors who want to sell products and services to those companies. They are part of our ecosystem. And because of that, 
All the innovative SMEs in the region come to us because they want to engage with these organizations as well. And we want to make this building a melting pot where we can bring corporate organizations in to learn about this stuff. But at the same time, there will be SMEs and startup groups and meetups talking about technology who can then mingle and mix with, this, uh, with the corporates in order to try to transfer innovation. And finally, the students, because we're dealing with all of these businesses, the students want to come to us because they want to work with these businesses. Many students that we work with would love to stay in this region. They would love to have an opportunity to stay in this region. But often when they finish their degree, they don't have an opportunity for an immediate job, and so they move out of the region. So we're trying very hard to keep them here. We try to get our PhD students, we try to get them hitched up as early as possible and hopefully have kids so we trap them in the region forever. <laughs> so, uh, so in summary, we're trying to build a beacon for data innovation. It's a temple to data. It's a place where data professionals will want to come and engage. But so, we hope, will citizens, school kids, students, and so on. We want this to be a lively, animated building where we run lots of events that appeal to you guys as well as appealing to data professionals. World-class facilities, as you've seen, it's an absolutely beautiful building. Um, we're all about this third bullet point, which has been cut off slightly, unfortunately. Um, Delivering next generation skills, that's our driver. If we can do that, then we can really deliver impact to the regional businesses and help generate the sort of wealth that was generated um, earlier by um, utilizing uh, the, the raw resources um, of 200 years ago, like coal, but today that's the case. Okay, thank you very much. Right, well, I did say at the beginning that um, we were going to have time for questions. So, Mick <coughs> and Steve, yep. you've both <coughs> given us lots. Well, I'm going to sit on the edge, okay. yes. Um, you've given us lots to think about, and I'm sure there are lots of questions from the audience. We've got microphones, which I hope are going to work, are they, gentlemen? <coughs> have you got microphones? Yes. Yeah, there they are. Um, so, who would like to put some questions to our two panellists? Right, in the, one there. Can we get a microphone there, please? And one there. And we'll start with the gentleman in the sweater there, and then I'll come to you, sir, in the cream jacket. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very interesting sessions. And it's a question for Steve. Would you like to, uh, so, so sorry to interrupt you, would you like oh, to tell us your name and where you're yes, from? Yes, my name thank is uh, David Parker. I'm uh, an alumni of the university um, from just a few years ago. <laughs> so I'm uh, coming into your uh, <laughs> remit. Um, yeah, it's a question for Steve. Uh, is the uh, computing capacity, power of computing, keeping up with uh, data generation in the sense, I don't know what the juxtaposition of yeah. your uh, data acceleration with Moore's law uh, looks like? So, so the, the great news from, from a data analytics point of view is computing resource is keeping up. And the reason for that is cloud computing. So we no longer, in our entire building, we don't have a single server in the building. Everything we do runs on cloud computing. And the scales there are absolutely enormous. So Google by themselves are estimated to have just about two million servers. So a server is basically the box sitting on your desk at your computer. You imagine St. James's Park full of those and then imagine 20 of those. And that's one company's computing resource. So, and that's getting incredibly cheap and incredibly easy to access. So it's not the storage, which is fantastic. We can store as many bits as blah, blah or the computing resource, the key thing that is, that is stopping us innovating around data at the moment is skills. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah, but what, what I'd like to know though is, I mean, we're talking specifically about the way in which data may help the aging process and people who are aging. Yeah. Is all, let me just ask a very basic, simple question. Is all of that going to be made a lot easier for people to understand? Because, I mean, there's always a joke which says, you know, if you can't organize your, 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 your television these days, which is all computerized, get a 12-year-old to do it for yep, you. Yep. We don't want 12-year-olds. We want people who are older to be able to understand all of this. And it's all very exciting what you've been talking about. But are they making it sufficiently understandable so that everyone is going to be able to use it and get the benefit of it? So, so I think... Turn to make in a second, but I think mm. one of the things that's making a big difference here is the voice interface. Yes. So is Alexa and Google Home and so on. My my own father is going; he's early stage dementia now, but actually he gets a huge amount of enjoyment in his own home by talking to Google. We get him to play music that he hasn't heard in thirty years, and um, but also use it to call people and so on. That interface is becoming so much simpler as time goes by. I think it's getting to the point where. 
and all of those facilities that are being offered by this cloud computing is available to you through that interface. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. The gentleman here had a Hello. question. I'm Jim Edwardson. I was the uh, founding director of the Institute for Aging here at Newcastle. And I want to ask why some huge sectors of commerce are so resistant to the kind of exciting um, view that you've been giving us this evening. And I've got a specific example. About 13 or 14 years ago, I took a dozen elder people from the Elders' Council here in Newcastle to Berlin to see what was hailed as the world's first age-friendly supermarket. It was fantastic. There were no shelves too high to reach or too low to get down to. The aisles were wide enough for trolleys, electric wheelchairs, a bell on every aisle so you could summon assistance. The print on their own products was large enough to read for anyone with decent vision. They had magnifying sheets for the, the things they were buying in from other providers who weren't up to that. They had natural daylight from their illumination rather than the kind of lighting which distorts the color of fruit and vegetables and so on. And we came back and we reported on that. We got it into the local newspaper and on local television. And for a fortnight, we went absolutely international. It was the busiest period of my entire academic career to being kind of on radio, television, giving interviews and so on. 15 years later, there is not a single age-friendly supermarket in this country. Another thing they did was, if they had a discount, it was 20% off oranges, it was 20% if you bought one orange or whether you bought 100 oranges, which was great for singletons. In their first year, their turnover was 200% more than they had estimated when they did their planning for the site. And God, you go into the average supermarket today around here, and it's almost impossible. They deliberately rearrange the aisles every few months. So you yes, you need a map, don't so you? Why, why, why are we not getting through to these people? It sounds we need, fantastic. We need one of these age-friendly supermarkets on the site we've got for the campus for aging and vitality, and anybody who's got a few million to invest, <laughs> there's a great, huge business opportunity. It sounds fantastic, Jim, and I, I can't believe that we haven't actually got that, but it does open up the whole question, I think, to Nick, about why it is that so many businesses, so many large areas of commerce, are not alive to the fact that because we're all living longer, because we're all going to be relatively fit longer, that actually there's a whole commercial world out there of people who could be doing with the very sort of thing that Jim is talking about. Why hasn't business kept in touch with that? First, because we don't ask them, so we don't ask people what they I want. bet Jim did. Well, <laughs> yes, Jim, in Japan there are several of these supermarkets yes. that are just growing in a specific country. It's a long way to go here. I know. <laughs> could be even cheaper by sake or something yes. else for the possible. So it's first thing is that because we're not asking the people. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Second is historically there is a, a um, brands stays away from things that smell old. So that's the point. That sounds not cool enough to be interesting for the population, which is a very, uh, let me say, stupid way to approach. But if you go in whatever marketing department, typically you will see this kind of mind mindset and it's very hard to engage these brands to change slightly the perception they could have over the mass. And that's, I think you've seen it from those data about what investors are investing, despite the fact that the, the population with the higher spending is the population in their 60s or 70s, because also they mm. have gained, earned some money in long life. So these are two first things. But I say is that the combination of these two factors is just pumping up this idea of the longevity economy on one hand, and the point is that I think we were focusing most of our life, and I look at all of you, about the needs and not the wants. So I think it's time to change this narration. We always thought that since, again, you're in that basket of the after 65, you need something to scratch your back that is uh, sensible, or you need some specific things, or maybe you need the, the some kind of supermarket that maybe are slightly changing, because I think there is another thing that we have to consider. The, progress of aging, so the, the span of life, it's now uh, embedding different generations, mm -hmm. all them classified in the age space. And again, I think that's a problem I was trying to highlight at the beginning. Where is the diversity? Now, with some of the technology that 
uh, Steve showed before and in the chart I put there, the, this idea of being able to personalize the things, I guess it's probably where we're going. So Alexa is very powerful to recognize me versus someone else. And by the way, we're going towards a world without interfaces. So we will think about and the things will happen. It's going to happen, I, th I think not um, 10 years, probably 10 years, maybe less. So, and that will be hyper per personalized because we'll be able to recognize them. So theoretically, following your suggestion, which is absolutely uh, a given in my opinion, and by the way, we're trying to engage some of the local um, groceries to do some work around that field. Tesco, Sainsbury, just to, to just grab probably easier to reach in the region just to engage them exactly on the same concept, but also involving all the people from Voice, for example, in the play to tell us more about their wants and the needs, and maybe the wants could be related to oh, discounts on some project, not pro products, sorry, not necessarily having the things more accessible, which is a given in my opinion. But it's what you were saying about putting people at the center. Yeah, absolutely. And what is it going to take then, do you think? You mentioned talking perhaps to some of the supermarkets locally. Presumably, if you can persuade one or two of them here in Newcastle to do this, it would then filter down through Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Waitrose, and if it works here, it could work in the rest of the country. So how quickly do you think you would be able to do that? I think, and then I go back the ball probably to Steve that can add a flavor. The first thing is just, that's why I was pushing that much on fashion, yeah. on lifestyle. So if we're able to engage the television to tell stories in a proper way, or the brands to show that uh, being uh, or buying some products, it's cool enough. So the narration, mm. and sorry if I say this very stupid way to say it, because cool is not, it's just, just a word that is not telling anything, but we understand the span around this world. So it's making you feel good. So it goes back to the idea of healthy aging. So be part of this society, be considered as who I am, be respected, preserve my dignity, and each one of us on each seat has his own idea of dignity. So it's very personal. So if we're able to understand that, that thing and engage the brands and fashion and TV and, and the entertainment, in my opinion, has to tell the story to help us feel part of the society, then the data, and that was my, the other side of, of things, we probably can be able not to necessarily ask each one of the individual, but harness some of that mm. understanding and that intelligence through the data and provide messages and services that could be more feasible for them. But what works for people that are older works for everybody. And I suppose the answer would be for that kind of alteration in a store to be so subtle that in fact it doesn't scream at you, this is for old people. It's just this is a way of making that's the a, supermarket a better for everybody to use. A matter of, of language. Thank there. you very yeah. much. Can, and who else has a question, please? Um, can we get the microphone up there? Anybody else have a question? And could we get the other microphone, sir, that you have? To that gentleman there, please, or that you had, you gave it up. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir, your question. David your name? David. David. David Black, voice member. How do we get data out of care homes when they're still recording? Um, information using paper and a pen? Very, a very good question, and, and, it, and it's a question that not only applies to care homes, it applies to the NHS more broadly. I'll, yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, I went to, a, a, I won't name the hospital trust, but a regional hospital trust a while ago, who told me they were really interested in AI, artificial intelligence, and they, what they wanted to do was use bedside monitors to collect all this data, and then be able to predict <coughs> when someone was going to have an incident in the middle of the night. And I thought, this is fantastic, this is really exciting. And I walked out the door, and I went into the corridor, and a guy walked past me pushing a trolley that was piled that high and that wide with paper from one department to the next, right? So the answer is, there's a long way to go before you can do that, right? And they've also got a system that doesn't work terribly well throughout the NHS. There's that as well. So, so the first step in all of that is capturing your data, managing it properly, and then in a few years' time, there's an opportunity to use that data but we've a long way to go. You need the skills to be able to do that. But don't we also need a system that is universal throughout the NHS, throughout care homes? So it's, it's, it's no good having a system that works well in one health trust absolutely. if it doesn't 
connect with another health trust. It's one of the frustrations of, I've done quite a lot of work with the NHS, and one of the frustrations I have is that citizens think that once they give their data to someone in the NHS, to their GP mm -hmm. or the hospital, mm -hmm. when they go in next time, the data's there. Why wouldn't it be? But actually, there are firewalls everywhere inside that organization blocking data from moving. Yes. And that's the, that's the barrier that needs to be overcome. But, I mean, you're nodding your head. What, what, what's it going to take to achieve that? Why I ask? It's on. It's on. It's on. Why I ask is uh, I visit my mum in a care home. Yeah. Um, and I go to a lot of innovation events. And I met this lady who's got this system where you can record half hour observations um, on a tablet. Yeah. I mentioned it to the manager of the care home. And she says, we can't do that because the regulator, the yeah. Care Quality Commission, um, see what happens when the system goes down. Yeah. Um, can we rely on that? There's, it seems like the regulators live in, in the past, if you like. Yeah. And yeah. that's the only reason, because I've, I've investigated and went round full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I may add two things. One thing that he didn't say is that the second most requested profession in the world after computer scientists is caregivers, which is absolutely a market from a, a human perspective. Um, in one of the projects I did in my life, uh, we were trying to provide information about uh, older adults in their homes to, to caregivers. In the beginning, our first enemy were the caregivers themselves, because they were just saying more or less the same stuff you were, you were saying, also thinking that technology could somehow, let me say, pull out this human and, and empathic interaction, thinking literally as a caregiver, as a robot. Then, instead of you provide data and insight to stakeholders, that are you know, surrounding the, the industry of care, then finally the best ally were exactly the caregivers who realize how much this in information could be important for them. For example, knowing the person they are going to care, how was feeling, how was doing. And knowing it before could literally save the life of the caregivers because we all know that the danger of people that could be abandoned or left alone mm -hmm. and had a very bad night. And you're the first one meeting this person in the morning. And if you don't know what's happened the night before, that and this is just one of the main examples about how data can help these entities. It's true what I say, there is a lot that has to be done also from the political perspective, and it takes time. Is this also a generational problem? That we have a situation at the moment where so much of artificial intelligence, so much technology, is so very new and changing so very quickly. You know, I mean, I, I see four-year-olds on telephones. Young people know how to use the technology. Those of us that are older maybe take a little longer. But actually, in a generation's time, because we will have, I mean, I grew up with paper and pencil. I still like to write things down, yeah. as do an awful lot of people of my generation. Are we going to get an entire generation that are so used to using technology yeah. and artificial intelligence that many of the problems that we have now will actually disappear simply because that generation will be the 60 and the 70 and the 80 year olds mm -hmm. and it will become second nature for well, them. Maybe. Um, there's, there's another way of viewing that, and that is that the generation today that knows how to run iPads and swipe and so on won't be the experts in the thought processes in running computers through thought. So they'll be the laggards then. So the, yeah. the problem often is that people who've been doing a job for a long time yeah. in a particular way are reluctant to change. Yeah. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Right. Gentlemen in the back there, yes, your name please, sir. Hello, um, I'm another David as a voice member, this time David Innes. Right. Um, one of the dystopian features about data is control. Yep. Um, who knows what companies know about us how can we find out easily, and how can we remove that data if we wish to easily? So in Europe, that's considerably easier than yeah. it is in the US. With GDPR now, there are strong protections around private data. Um, the problem is that most of the tank companies are US-based. So trying to work out what Amazon holds about you, or Google, or Facebook, is immensely difficult. So somebody told me the other day, it came as a complete surprise to me, apparently there's a website you can go to where you can find out all the, everything you have said to Google. So Google's recording everything that you're saying and you can go there and actually interrogate that and find where that data is. Can you ask them to remove it? I'm not so sure. So the problem is that we're under a different legal control. All of our data is being held by, by US businesses and we don't have the same sanctions over those businesses that we have in Europe. Should we be worried about the amount? Uh, to, to some extent, we are, right? 
But Should we be worried about the amount of data that they have? I'm, I'm just thinking, I, like many people in the room, read that Alexa is listening all the time. Yes. Yeah. And, and I find things like, um, if I'm buying something on, uh, I don't know what, on, online, yep. I may go to a company I've never been to before. I put my name in and automatically all of my information then comes up. Yep. How the heck did they get that? Yeah. Where is yeah. it? Yeah. Are we actually, are we very much the victims of too much data being available over which we have no control? If I may add, I think that uh, I think it's a very good question, and it's exactly how uh, Steve described. But probably, uh, I think we're coming to a time where all the corporations, even the American ones, uh, they can't do any more business without ethical business. So it's becoming a sort of a paradigm that if you have data, these data have to be treated in an ethical way. And when we mean ethical way, should allow us, for example, so these are some of the rules of the ethical computing, for example. Uh, the transparency of the processes, the explainability of the processes, so the decision that is bringing uh, a, a bank, for example, to suggest a, a mortgage to me different from her, which is based on the fact that I'm a man, she's a woman, should be explained in order to prove that this information is being treated properly. The accountability of data, all these elements, components are, let me say, a philosophy which is coming up where companies are realizing they must deal with because otherwise the next Cambridge Analytica scandal will pop up back again, and the, the next and the next and the next problem will generate the power for us as citizens to be treated by company that way, so we avoid to do business with these companies. And again, I think it's something coming very clearly to all the big corporations that they have to deal, uh, since they're treating more and more data coming from humans as, as individuals in an ethical way, because otherwise they will be out of the business. That's what, it, what I think is going to happen. I wonder how many other people get annoyed like I do. If I look up <laughs> something on, on Google or I guess whatever, everyone when can I'm leave typing, hand. I'll come with little adverts on the side that say, oh, you were interested in this. Would you like to know more about that? No. <laughs> we have another question. Gentleman here, can we get a microphone to this gentleman? Any other questions from, and, oh, and, oh, over there, sorry, and we'll get a microphone over there, please, as well. Yes, sir. I'm John Lloyd, another member of Voice, and I look upon all this audience probably as being young. <laughs> I don't think you get old till you're 90. <laughs> I want to know whether the universities see they have a responsibility somewhere within their system to uh, tell people what it is to get old when they're only 30 what they have to expect in 50 years' time, and how will cybersecurity solve the problems of masses of information that you don't want other people to know? Yeah. When you say no, no about growing old, what mean, you mean the, the kind of problems you're likely to have, have with your health? Or avoid the problems of age. Yes. Okay. Live well without medics. Well, put all those doctors out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Nick. No, the first thing is that the Newcastle University has an amazing heritage, and again, I have to call back in, in, on stage theoretically uh, Louise, because all the work that has been done is explaining and understanding all the processes of aging, which is a, a capital we have here as a university that I understand your point, and I completely agree, and I take it as a suggestion for us on how we can translate all this knowledge in and trying to push it to the younger generation, which, by the way, seems to be very aware of all the technology, but they don't care at all about the data that are sharing, so they don't care about it. And it's another thing that we should mm. have to teach them to be aware since their 30s or 20s or 12 that what's happening with their data, that then could be, be a, a smoother process uh, uh, on the different stages of life. I completely agree should on that. Should we ask Dame, Dame Louise, actually, because you are the, the Regis Professor of Aging here at the university, C can you answer that, in the way in which you can actually prepare? It's, it's almost preparing young people for knowing what it means to grow old and actually to have a better attitude towards older people because they're going to be old themselves one day. Well, I, th I think there's nothing magical. We know, we know the key things that m make our brains and our bodies um, age better. We know it's exercise. We know it's keeping fit, not smoking, 
having a good diet. But increasingly, we know about the importance of social networks. It's not just physical and environment. It's actually, you know, we know that actually if you're lonely, you're much more likely to get heart disease. So actually, there's a, we know all the factors. I think some of the difficulties are actually getting them implemented into practice uh, and sometimes getting governments to hear that those things are more important than some of the other things that are broadcast about. So I think we know very well what makes people age well. It's trying to get uh, initiatives in place that enable that to happen at a population and the community's level. And whose responsibility should that be? Should that be government or, as, as John is suggesting, should it be the responsibility of universities when, after all, you have this massive young population at your beck and call, basically, <laughs> every day. They're going to class, they're, they're talking to professors. Is it something that can come from when you're in, at university? I think our responsibility is to do the excellent science and to ensure that government hears those messages and they hear accurately what the, what the facts are, what the science says. And that's part of the National Innovation Centres that yeah. actually we bring the good data, the high quality data, which our colleagues can then ensure is translated to, to mm. governments and to businesses yeah. so that they're working with accurate facts rather than something that is, if you like, a myth perhaps. I think For it's example, a lovely idea, John, but I mean, just think back to when you were in your 20s and 30s. Did you care very much about what it was going to be like to be 70 or 80? I think I was taught that you need money to provide for your old age. <laughs> <laughs> a good one to start with. Anyway, now we have a gentleman over there, I think. Yes? Yes, thank you for that uh, last question. It sort of was a good introduction. My name is Ian Richardson. I appreciated all the comments about services and products that were discussed through the presentations, but it was how do you get those technologies, those services out to the communities and to the people? Uh, I don't see that actually our current health services and social care interact very well and productively with citizens to give them the service that they want. Uh, so is there a gap that I haven't heard in the presentations this evening? Or is that something that we need to do work out harder? I think yeah. if Mike had been here, Mike Trinnell might have been able to answer I that, wouldn't Mike, he? I think Mike, but, yes. but uh, again, if from what we said, I think uh, the attempt to involve the, the main brands and break this kind of uh, glass ceiling, even in this situation there is a glass ceiling, where we can engage um, some of those that are able to reach millions of individuals all over the world and make this offering normal and not something special, I think it's there where is the magic that could happen so that all the institutions could probably, in, in a more fruitful way, share some of this technology to the benefit of all. So, and again, it goes back to, to how we make this wheel spin with example and trying to involve, that's what we aim to do here at the center, trying to involve the brands. Uh, Steve showed some of the brands. If we're able to have these entities here, it's a way to then engage them and provide some of this solution to a wider population because those institutions are literally reaching billions of users, not millions. Uh, certainly, certainly a frustration that I've come across in dealing with social care and healthcare is uh, the inability of those organizations to accept external innovation. And that's because they're not geared up to procure that innovation. They're geared up to be as efficient as they possibly can, yeah. especially at the moment when, when, when funding is very short. Um, and they're driven by KPIs that are set by government. They have no bandwidth at all to allow them to invest, to do the things that they really need to do in order to save money longer term or, and, and help people's lives. And isn't it al also difficult to in understand the way that people are going to interpret that information? Just, just to play devil's advocate here, I was listening to the radio this morning, I think it was, where they were talking about some research that's being done at Loughborough, or, or might have been yesterday morning, at Loughborough University, where they're suggesting that food manufacturers put on their labelling how many calories there are in a particular food and how much exercise you need to do yeah, to, burn to burn that <laughs> off. <laughs> and if you think about it, you think, what a good idea. And if I'm going to eat a chocolate muffin, I know I've got to walk the 25 minutes to to, to burn it off. <laughs> they had a phone-in that last, it must have been yesterday morning on Radio 5, and in that hour, 
you had one group of people saying, well, the trouble is I was anorexic, and if I read that information, that makes me think, oh my God, I'm going to have to exercise even more. That was a trigger for me to become even more anorexic. You had other people talking about the way that it would help if you have, um, as we have an obesity crisis among young yeah. children, that it would be good for them, and others saying no, that it would be bad psychologically mm -hmm. for people who didn't want to know how much they had to exercise. So it's, it's the way that people interpret that information, isn't it? It doesn't matter how well-meaning your research is and how you're able to prove the research by the facts that you can back it up with. Yeah. If people are not going to interpret it in the way that you want them to, it's, ne it's negated. Mm -hmm. How'd you get over that? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> she asked you, not me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> but, but I mean, I'm, I see a lot of you nodding your heads. I think you probably were aware of that. That was coming out yesterday. But it is a demonstration of, of doesn't matter how well-meaning your research is, you're not always going to get the message across in yeah. the way that you intended. Someone is always going to find the reverse of that. Do we have one more question? Gentleman in the middle there, you. Mike, Whilst you're getting the mic, I just have to say wh what a joy it was to listen to Radio 4 this morning because there was no politics. There were no politics. <laughs> How wonderful that was. Oh, wasn't it? <laughs> For a whole day. Well, I hate to tell you, but in a few hours it's going to start all yeah, over yeah. again. Let's enjoy it while we can in this wonderful little bubble here that's away from politics. Hello, yes. Colin Heron. Um, I'm an engineer. I spent all my life reading data. If it's not my data and I read somebody else's data, <laughs> I want job? to understand what the data is saying. One of the problems I have, and my poor wife here hears me screaming at the BBC on a regular basis, you is when both. you gentlemen produce the data, the media put it out in a format to scare the pants off people. Yeah. So it's either percentages, fractions, multiple, or whatever. And what we've seen in the election is bar charts and all sorts of data. I think we have a problem that the general public don't understand data. Absolutely. Not the kids, yeah. not us in the room. Yeah. So how can we stop the media manipulating research papers to scare the pants off people? And how can we upskill people now to understand what we're actually telling them? A Before little, you answer, little question. <laughs> can I just stand up for my colleagues so, so not in, in the media and say, we do not always manipulate the data. We do not really? always try to scare the pants off people, but try to present data in such a way that is understandable by the majority of the general public. And to say that we actually manipulate it, I think is um, a little exaggeration of what we actually do or try to do. But I take your point, because one of the programs that I work on is called Health, Truth, or Scare, yeah. which is a medical program where we look at headlines in the press which exaggerate health stories and those which tell the truth and try and pick the bones out of all of them. But the, I, I do appreciate that perhaps with very often the tabloid press, you will have headlines certainly and certain news stories that will exaggerate certain aspects of data, particularly medical data, um, which does not always give an accurate, an accurate picture of what the situation is. Having done my bit for my profession, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> So I'm afraid I have no short-term solutions here. I think the solution is to make uh, citizens more data aware, and I think we have to start with kids. Um, I think that's, that's the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is people see statistics and they don't go back to the source to find out where they came from. They don't understand the, the, the error, um, um, uh, the error in, in the results they're seeing. They don't understand the basics of, 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 of data analytics. We would like to see data analytics embedded as part of every course in a university. Because if you can't analyze data and make sense of it, you're not doing science at all. Right? So I'm afraid that's a long-term solution. Give us 20 or 30 years, we'll have it solved. <laughs> can, I, can I just also say that I think that social media has an awful lot to answer here. Because very often, someone will see a headline and take that data and completely misinterpret it. Sure. And make the, the cardinal sin of making an assumption and passing it off as fact and on social media, then that Bullshit, assumption yeah. becomes fact yeah. and spreads like wildfire. And again, that's why people are perhaps not as well informed about data as they should be. So yes, if we, I think it's not just getting people in a university to understand data. I think it's getting a younger generation to recognize the pitfalls of social media, what they should and should not be writing, and what they should and should not be taking at face value. 
And as somebody, again, who, yes, I will go back to my books and my paper and my pencils, um, who have lost the ability to research yeah. and to yeah. look for facts, yeah. either in books or on, on the internet. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I don't know, with your, do you find that that is the problem, that people are not looking up and checking the facts themselves before carrying the misinterpretations that they've made? You're agreeing with me. Well, I'm agreeing. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have two teenage children who, and this is, this is an old man's rant now, I'm about to go on, but I have two teenage children who are brought up at school to follow a syllabus and yes. learn exactly what's on the syllabus and not deviate from that, not go looking yourself, just follow the, and yeah. universities often complain about this, about getting kids in who've been trained in that way of thinking. So I do think there are changes to be made there oh, as good. well, but that's a big subject. Good, good. No more questions? Thank you all very much indeed, and I'm sure that on your behalf you would like me to thank, and you would like to show in the traditional way, our thanks to both Nick and to Steve. Thank, thank you both you. very thank much. You. Thank you. Just a couple of finishing words for me then. So what a great hour and a half we've had from two fantastic experts, which I hope have given you insight into what we're hoping to do with this building um, over the coming years. This essentially for us is an evening of celebration. It's uh, celebrating our first McArdle lectures, uh, the naming of the uh, McArdle Atrium uh, in Helen's honor, and of course of our long-standing 25 year plus excellence in aging, but perhaps even more a promise of what's to come. I'd like to invite you all uh, outside to join us for a, a, a reception in the atrium, but before we adjourn, Please join me once more in thanking our guests and speakers. So Helen McArdle, CBE, Angela Ripon, CBE, Professor Nick Palmerini, Professor Steve Cohey. I was going to say Professor Mike Trammell, but he stayed at home with his norovirus. <laughs> so thank you and best wishes for the festive season. Thank you.